Go ahead, Chuck. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Wethersfield Board of Education. It's Tuesday, November 24th, 2020. Mm -hmm. We are holding this meeting virtually in accordance with the governor's executive order. Ellen, can we have roll call, please? Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Mrs. Evans? Here. Mrs. Granado? Present. Mr. Lesser? Here. Mr. Michaels? Here. Mrs. Paradise? Present. Mr. Riley? Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? Here. Chairperson, Mr. Carey? Present. And please and let the record know Mr. Riley is here. Did he say present? I didn't hear him. He was but he is here. present. <laughs> there he goes. Thank you. Yes. So Mr. Riley is here. And Weathersfield High School student representative, Mr. Diago Nguyen. Here. All present. Thank you so much. Mr. Maltesi, can you lead us in the pledge, please? We can hear you. I pledge allegiance <laughs> to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, 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 America and to the Republic, Republic for which, which, which stands, one nation, one nation, nation under God, under God, God indivisible, 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 with liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Great job, Mike. Beautifully choreographed. <laughs> all right, moving on to approval of minutes. Ms. Paradise, I believe you have a motion for us. Motion to approve the minutes of November 10th, 2020 regular Board of Education meeting. So moved. Thank you. I'll there second. We have second. A second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, with a motion and a second at the table, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? <laughs> motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to public comment. Mr. Emmett, is there anyone on the phone? Uh, no one on the phone at this point in time, Mr. Carey. All right, I have two emails to read in that were sent in today. I read the first one by Christina Patterson, to whom it may concern. I hope that everyone is being healthy and safe during these difficult times. I personally know that it's not easy as a public servant in a local community, and more importantly, as a mother of a Wesleyan Elementary School children. I am here to voice my concerns for my children and all the children of Weathershield. I completely understand that times are tough across the board for each and every one of us. I will dive right into this. I feel like our neighboring towns are handling schooling for children a lot better than our administration in Weathershield. Glastonbury currently has elementary schools running at full capacity and they're doing a seamless job. Glastonbury has been doing this since the school year started. What happened in Weathersfield? It seems that Mr. Emmett haven't given this idea a chance. Second, Rocky Hill is doing the same thing. And again, why are we not giving it a fair chance? When I reached out to the superintendent's office in regards to concerns, they couldn't provide answers. Well, what answers have been given? Another email to say, we have another case in town. Let's speak facts and let's speak about the impact that this is having educationally, emotionally, and long, long term for our children. Our children are going to fall behind their fellow counterparts in surrounding communities, which is not acceptable. Parents aren't trained as wonderful teachers are to provide these children with the educational models that they need. What is the real answer? Are we making everyone after Thanksgiving homeschool to learn that our kids will be met with another disadvantage of we're remaining in hybrid through the winter just prior to the intended return date? In all, about, in all about public safety across the board and, and understand, we all are concerned with our kids and staff staying safe. I feel like our kids are at a complete disadvantage compared to neighboring districts. Parents who need to go to work each and every day outside of the home are struggling to properly provide the same educational experience that they would receive at school. Parents who are working remotely are struggling. I want what is best for our kids and I think it should be an option for our parents. If you want to keep your kids home, we respect it. If, if your parents want their kids at school, it should be happening. 
Parents need to stop allowing large groups of kids to gather. I know our kids miss friends, but we know we right, but right now we need to teach our kids what is safest. And by doing what is safe, our schools can go full time. I thank you for your time and your concerns and open ears. Please, as a community, let's do what's right for our children. Let's give get back, let's get them back in the classroom where they belong. Christina Foss Rugen. And I have one other email to read. To whom it may concern, I'm a parent of, a, of children enrolled in Wellsville Public School District. The structure that has been put in place in our community is a disgrace. Our children are falling way behind their peers in surrounding towns due to the lack of in-person learning in four, in four days school weeks. I can list town after town where students have been in class five days per week since September. Studies show COVID is not being spread in classrooms. I wonder what the problem is in Weathersfield and why we are so behind in being able to figure this out. I wonder why we think it's acceptable for our students. We are doing a huge disservice to our children and we need to follow other town leads to get our students back in the classroom. Thank you, Amy Blanco. No other comments, did, Mr. Emmett. Did they give any addresses? No, ma'am. Okay, Blanco, B-L-A-N-C-O? Yep. Okay, thank you. Anyone get on the phone while we were doing that, Mr. Emmett? No, Mr. Carey. Perfect. All right, moving on to communications, Mr. Emmett. Yes, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. And uh, as you well know, uh, this month has been extraordinarily challenging. Uh, you can see that by our dashboard, which is posted on our website and updated on a daily basis. Um, we currently, as of this evening, sit at a total of 58 positive cases in the town of Wethersfield in the public school system. 44 of those cases are positive cases among students and an additional 14 cases among staff. Uh, over the course of the past month, we have had to have Emerson Williams go full remote for two weeks. We are wrapping up a uh, remote learning experience at Silas Dean Middle School after having a total of 14 staff members and 99 students have to go out on quarantine. We have also struggled at Highcrest Elementary School to maintain that building being open, as well as Hanmer Elementary School. At the last Board of Education meeting, I had reported that Hanmer School had zero cases. And then within that period of two weeks, we now have five positive student cases, two positive staff cases. And at one point in time, had 16 staff members at Hanmer on quarantine. It is tough to run a building when you have that many staff members out. What we were able to do because of the fact that Silas Dean was on full remote, we were able to take building subs from Silas Dean as well as our other elementary schools to be able to float them over to Hammer to allow Hammer to continue to run. In addition to that, Mr. Cohn did yeoman's work of being able to identify specific cohorts that had smaller numbers and was then able to provide them with a full remote learning opportunity and still maintained the building being open. This has been a monumental task. As you know, I reported last Friday that the Weathersfield Public Schools will open next week in a full remote model. It is only for a week. It is an opportunity for all of those who will be traveling to adhere to the travel advisory and make sure to avoid a 14 day quarantine that you have ample time to get tested. Let me talk a little bit about the process of getting tested these days. Last evening, I got a phone call regarding a positive case that we had at Highcrest Elementary School. This positive case was an independent contractor that had close contact with three of our staff members here in town. Three of them had to quarantine. One made an appointment or attempted to make an appointment to get a test. The earliest appointment date was this coming Sunday then went to Rentschler Field this morning to be tested and the wait was hours long. We're giving this opportunity for, for uh, full remote to allow staff members and families to be able to, that, especially those that are uh, traveling, to get the test in order to be able to avoid quarantine. We see what the reality is. I could tell you right now that we have not seen spread within school, but when we were talking about that close contact, we're talking about quarantine, 
At the beginning of the week, we were north of 300 staff members and students being quarantined. We only have so many subs to go around. And you know, when we talk about other districts, I do meet with my colleagues on a weekly basis. And I know that the area towns are also struggling with being able to maintain full in-person learning. This has been a challenge. My hope is as the uh, public comment said about gatherings, social gatherings and sports, we found that those were the two chief areas where we had spread. We need to make sure we're doing a good job of social distancing and using all of our mitigation strategies to get through this wave. One of the things we look at is we look at the metric and the metric over the past uh, four weeks, 10.5 or 10.6, excuse me, 15.6, 22.5 and now up to 37.5 in terms of the positivity rate. That shows widespread community spread. And at this point in time, we look at 25 as being a marker for looking for more remote learning. I'm trying to avoid more remote learning, but it's gonna take a concerted effort. It's gonna take a concerted effort on the part of staff. We should not be quarantining or having to quarantine staff who have come into close contact with each other. So the reminder went out last week to make sure that in staff lounges, you are maintaining social distance. We are creatures of habit, we're social creatures. We like to socialize. But right now we need to maintain that appropriate social distance, our staff and our students as well. Again, moving forward, it is not my intention to extend the, the closure or uh, the extension of remote learning any longer than we have to. I want these kids in. As you are keenly aware, we were uh, embarking upon our full reopening the first week of November, our data said otherwise. And I think with the number of positive cases we have seen explode in this district over the past couple weeks, that is um, unfortunately the reality. We want to keep our kids safe. We want to keep our kids in. Um, and we're going to continue to work carefully with the Central Connecticut Health District to make sure that happens. So that's the piece on full remote learning. And again, we're going to look at the data. If we continue to see a high number of cases uh, and we have to reconsider, and close for longer, certainly we're going to do so. But it is our intention to get the kids back in as soon as we can. One of the things that we talked about uh, at a recent DPH meeting uh, was what is the metric around when we go to full in? And the DPH reports, there is no metric. There is no magic number for when we get kids in. I will tell you this, we will focus very heavily on getting our elementary students in first and foremost. As you know, our reopening plan called for pre-K, K and one. That will be the first uh, group of grade levels that come back when the CCHD and the DPH uh, deem it safe to do so. We definitely want our kids in, but we're gonna do this from a perspective of health and safety first. We've said that since this um, pandemic started and really took off back in early March. Other items for communication this evening, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, just wanna let everybody know that we have an upcoming Social Justice Coalition uh, meeting that is scheduled for Monday, November 30th at 5.30 p.m. The title of this session is Our Town, Our Commitment, Setting Priorities. And this is gonna be an opportunity for us to hear from the community about what priorities uh, community members see that the steering committee can help facilitate. So we're looking forward to an interactive conversation. Um, all of our upcoming social justice coalition meetings, unfortunately still are virtual. I'm looking for the time period where we can actually get together in person. I long for those days, along with an in-person board meeting. Hopefully we'll get there soon. If you are interested in attending the social justice coalition, please visit our website. Uh, there is registration information. Uh, our last count when we met with uh, steering committee uh, last Wednesday, we had 89 uh, community members signed up. So we're certainly looking forward to uh, a lively conversation coming up next Monday. I, I want to uh, also provide you with uh, an important piece of news. Um, this is kind of bittersweet for, for me and certainly for the district as well. I've been informed that our longtime Weathersfield High School principal, Mr. Thomas Moore, has announced that he will be retiring. Mr. Moore has served as principal at Weathersfield High School since 2001, a long and illustrious 20 year career here in Weathersfield. 
We will be starting our process for the selection of the next instructional leader at Weathersfield High School very early in January with the anticipation of having this position filled as of July 1st, 2021. So heartfelt congratulations uh, to Mr. Tom Moore and thank you for your 20 years of service. And finally, last but not least, I'd like to uh, wish everyone this evening a happy, safe and healthy Thanksgiving. That's communications, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Moving on to action items. Mr. Healy, I believe you have a motion. Okay, hold on a second. Let me go to... Yes, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I recommend a motion that we approve the new curriculum integrated science, which is a reference to on your agenda. And I'll explain after the motion is made. Thank you, do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. Granato. With the motion uh, yeah, thank you. Real briefly, this uh, you've got the uh, breakdown uh, of the course uh, in front of you, the units, uh, the outline of this course for freshmen. Um, I know Sally will jump in if I make a mistake, but I think it's a very good, rigorous um, course for kids for science at a critical age. And obviously, um, the more we do with science and offer that to our kids and engage them at this level, I think is critical. And I just uh, want to commend Sally and others who put it together. Um, uh, Tom Brown and Brandon Chatfield as well uh, for their work on this. I think it's a great looking course and I'm excited about it and uh, ask that the uh, board uh, approve it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Ely. Mr. Stoll, do you have anything to add? I thought he did a good job, but. No, he did an excellent job. So thank you for that. Flattery will get you everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Take the rest of the night off. Any <laughs> questions or comments? Mr. Can I ask a quick yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to uh, to Sally or to Chris, is this replacing uh, a current science class or is this just an additional class added to the curriculum? Uh, that's a great question. It is a current class. Uh, our ninth graders have been taking this class for probably over eight years. Um, this reflects their changed in the curriculum. So the original curriculum was written based upon the Connecticut core standards for science. Um, several years ago, uh, Connecticut adopted the NGSS standards, um, National Gen Next Generation Science Standards. So this curriculum uh, reflects some changes in the curriculum to reflect some new standards. Um, it is also a foundational course that prepares our um, juniors for taking the NGSS assessments in science also. So this curriculum is aligned to that assessment. Got it. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Sally, for making that clear. I should have done so, but uh, thank you. Ms. Granato. Um, we had a robust conversation at the um, Student and Program and Services meeting that night, too, on it. Um, and I went back over it, and it is it is a an excellent uh, curriculum that they have created. Um, one quote I wanted to say to everyone is, it says, students are encouraged to make connections between the phenomena studied and things they have experienced and observed in their own daily lives. And that's what we've been trying to do. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. So that was excellent. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none with a motion in a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstention? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Moving on to reports and discussion items. Mr. Emmett, the first read of the proposed calendars 2021 22 and 22 23. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Uh, this uh, document or these documents come before you for a first read uh, this evening uh, prior to uh, hopeful approval at the first board meeting in the month of December. Uh, this uh, process was carried out by a committee of uh, teachers, administrators, and uh, administrative uh, assistants. Uh, these are two calendars for the upcoming two school years. Um, traditionally, the board has done a two-year um, calendar in advance uh, to allow parents the opportunity for planning purposes around vacations. 
Um, I will say that uh, one item on the calendar that occurred with collaboration with the town is the uh, day after New Year's Day being a day off um, with the uh, custodial contract. The custodial contract calls for that day off as a recognition of New Year's Day. So given the fact that it's a contractual obligation, uh, we built that in to our calendar uh, because we know full well our buildings cannot operate without having our custodians in place. So at this point in time, uh, it's available for feedback. It is up on our website. So uh, any uh, feedback that you may have, please provide that. And we'll look to bring this before you again uh, uh, in December. Excellent. Mr. Ms. Granato. Michael, I just had one question as the committee got together. Did anyone think of um, not calling it Columbus Day just because of the news around that? Yeah, we, we did not have any specific discussion around that. I know there are some area districts that have talked about it becoming Indigenous Peoples Day. I know um, I like there are several. Either, yeah. yeah, so that's certainly something that, uh, you know, down the road, perhaps the board can uh, take up and take a look at. Um, the other thing I want to bring your attention to also is that uh, one of the changes that we uh, talked about was having uh, a regular school day on Veterans Day. Uh, and that is one uh, thing that we're look, looking at to change that will uh, involve a conversation with the secretaries and Paris union. But as uh, you may know, we will be negotiating with them in the spring. Uh, the idea, and this really was driven by the teachers with the support of administration, was to utilize that day on Veterans Day um, to be a rich and robust uh, discussion and learning opportunity for our kids around the idea of Veterans Day and what it means and what it entails. Thank you. Michael, um, question on the um, tentative end of school days. I know uh, for so many years in the past, they've always been tentative because of snow days. Now with the onset of remote learning, will we look to do away with snow days uh, if the school buildings aren't open and have remote learning and then and thus make those tentative end of school days, um, you know, just the permanent end of school day, uh, not needing necessarily to factor in snow days. That is a great question, Mr. Lesser. One of the things that you will see coming up on the agenda for the December board meeting is a presentation of our snow day remote learning day guidelines. So we have a, a committee of individuals that sat down and took a look at the state guidelines, which came out over the past month. And uh, we are looking at uh, presenting to you a combination. First two days would be snow days, followed by any remaining days being uh, remote learning. So we'll have a lot more detail coming up uh, for the December meeting. Thank you, Michael. You Mike, Mr. Emmett, if I remember right, I believe the state board only approved that for this year. That is correct, sir. Yes. So the remote learning wouldn't take place next year, Kenny, unless it gets approved. Got it. Thanks, it was only sir. for this year they approved it. Any other questions? Excellent. Moving on to update on the high school sports, Mr. Emmett. Yes, I'm pleased to uh, have with us this evening, Mr. Mike Maltesi, our athletic director slash assistant principal over at Weatherseal High School. And, uh, you know, obviously we uh, typically would have our athletes be recognized during staff student recognition at a live board meeting. Um, nothing was normal uh, over the course of this fall. So Mr. Maltesi has a brief presentation, a wrap up fall sports and a, a brief glimpse into uh, winter sports, which as you know, currently on hold until uh, mid January. So Mr. Maltesi. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. Uh, Chairperson Kieran, Board of Education. I have some information to share with you regarding uh, the past fall season. Certainly it was a season full of constant changes as I'm sure Mr. Emmett kept you abreast of. Uh, it was also abnormal, as you know, it was fluid if we're allowed to use that word still in education. It was exhausting, but it really was exciting. And for the students that were able to uh, get onto the fields, onto the court and into the pool, uh, we were able to put out, uh, I think a meaningful experience for them, especially our seniors who, who lost quite a bit their, their junior year as they head into a fall brand new school year able to put on that uniform one last time. So I did prepare a, a brief slideshow. Uh, I'll, I'll talk over as I kind of go through the fall, uh, some of the timeline that occurred during the summer, which preceded the fall season and what I expect or don't expect for the, for the winter season. So I'm gonna attempt to share my screen at this point in time. 
You're brave. And I hope everyone can hear me still. Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. And I, I believe you all received this information from Mrs. Murphy in, in the packet, so I'm certainly not going to um, read it all to you. But uh, down in the athletic office, it's really a three-person uh, department with our athletic trainer and our administrative secretary. We are active and um, out there on social media, and we have a very uh, robust website as well, which uh, the community is encouraged to, to, to visit. Um, so fall sports in 2020 really began back in, in August, where the CIC on August 10th, um, was ready to put out all of their protocols and, and, and all of the new things in place as we look to combat what was really unknown at the time in, in, in regards to the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, but as you can see, as quickly as August 12th, uh, they then began to change their mind. And a plan they had put forth for all of our athletes to start uh, on August uh, 19th uh, was, was then taken away almost less than a week, week away. And our football kids especially took the brunt of all this change with, with the CIC. And uh, back and forth on the 10th, the 12th, and the 14th, football was on, football was off, football was back on, and football was, was off again. Um, it was decided in the middle of August uh, to begin work on the 29th, and that would include football again. Uh, but all of our coaches were required to keep kids in small cohorts of 10 for, um, um, for, for the unforeseeable future, probably about a three-week period of time. Um, there would be no contact whatsoever in any of our sports uh, with, with football, cheer dance, uh, even uh, along with soccer, field hockey, and, uh, and our other fall sports. Uh, prior to that 29th coming, um, football was again taken off the table, and we wasn't sure at that point in time what football would, what would look like. I just want to make a note there that at the same time, and what was confusing to many of our families and, and all of our kids and, and, and me and I think the entire administration was youth football was allowed to take place here in Connecticut. So tackle football began on August 1st uh, over, over at Webb Elementary School with, with students ages uh, six to 14. So you could have on one street a 14 year old eighth grader playing complete tackle football and you could have a 14 year old freshman who wasn't allowed to, to put a pad or a helmet on. Um, and as we tried to just, uh, uh, gather as much information we could from the CIC but in local health departments we were unable to get a lot of uh, a lot of answers. Uh, ultimately we were able to start practices on September 21st uh, five weeks later than the initial uh, start date. Um, with that we had some some pretty um, stiff regulations we had to uh, we, we had to follow um, and I'll get into those in, ju in just a minute. Uh, we began games on, on October 1st. Uh, prior to that, it was announced that the, uh, on the 29th of September, actually, it was announced that the uh, football season would not go on in the fall and that there was hopes to have an alternative season uh, at some point in the winter. And the time frame they have for there is somewhere between February and April. But we've yet to uh, receive any guidance or what that might even look like if, if, it, if it should happen. Um, uh, on November 5th, uh, so ultimately three months after all of this talk began in, in August, Governor Lamont issued an executive order uh, setting parameters on youth sports. So it wasn't until two weeks ago that high school sports and youth sports began to see any type of parallel decision making uh, over at the state. Uh, we concluded our season on, on November uh, 12th uh, and five days later, it was announced that our winter sports wouldn't start till at a minimum, January 19th. So that was kind of a timeline heading into the fall season. Um, and, again, and again, I talk about all the benefits of high school interscholastic athletics, really the benefit of any extracurricular activity at any K-12 K school uh, that, that we have here in Mothersfield or across the state or across our country. Um, so what was different uh, this year is we talked about mitigating strategies, a word or a phrase a year ago, I don't think anybody had ever really heard, heard or used. But what we did this year at Weathersfield High School daily was we gave out an electronic COVID screen. So any athlete had to complete a 10 question there, um, <coughs> asking them about their different symptoms. Any student with a symptom was contacted by me or contacted by Mrs. Rizzola in the athletic office. And we had to verify whether or not that, that uh, uh, if symptom was valid. We talked to that parent, we held them out of practice and or out, out of school. 
Uh, we cohorted athletes. Uh, we completely changed our schedule. Uh, we came up with three different drafts of a schedule for boys soccer, girls soccer, cross country, field hockey, volleyball, um, and, and, and girls swim. Uh, we limited our spectators. It, as I'm sure many of you saw in a few of the emails to the, the Board of Education and to administration, we limited our spectators to uh, 25 percent in the natatorium to less than 20 in our gymnasium and less than 100 on, on Cotone Field. Um, we reduced a lot of our, our travelers on our buses, limited the number of managers. Uh, one really great thing I think that did come out of this uh, past fall with the pandemic is we really improved uh, many of our technology uh, skills. And we were here in the athletic department able to live stream just about every varsity game. And we did that on Facebook Live. We did that on, on YouTube Live. Uh, and many thanks to some of our technology department, which I'll, I'll thank them later. So uh, if anything good came out of that, people who weren't able to get a ticket to one of our games or maybe weren't in state or weren't feeling well could watch their, their son or daughter or grand, grandchild uh, play. And all of us athletic directors in the Central Connecticut Conference attempted to live stream as many games as, as, as possible. Uh, we had 381 students participate in our athletic program this, this fall and very proud that uh, not one of our teams was, was quarantined. I'd like to think that our coaches did a good of a job as they could have um, adhering to all the mitigating strategies, keep, keeping our kids safe on a, on a daily basis. The kids were great, the parents were great, Students that weren't feeling well kept themselves away from, from, from the masses. And I do appreciate all of their hard work and effort uh, um, you know, with that. So again, hopefully 20 years back, uh, certainly these kids will, will remember what fall of 2020 looked like, but we do have a few pictures of our teams that doesn't look that uh, different than maybe years, years past. Um, and, and the reason some of you may ask why they don't have their masks on, they were allowed to compete without a mask. So we felt that taking a, a brief photo uh, without a mask would, would be appropriate and be and, and be safe. Well, don't go fast. Don't go fast. Don't go that fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so our, our football team was offered the opportunity, um, albeit it wasn't Friday Night Lights. It wasn't uh, uh, on, on Cotone Field. Uh, you know, on some of those gorgeous Friday afternoons, Friday evenings, but we did compete in a 7v7 and a lineman challenge. So we, we did that against Middletown, um, Newington, and, and Berlin in kind of a home and away series to give them a, a little taste of, of, of football, as long as we we're following all of the CD, uh, CDC guidelines and, and Department of uh, uh, Health, Central Connecticut Department of Health. Uh, we were able to continue with senior nights. So again, one of my goals this year and, and last year as we ended 2020 was to not have kids really miss out on, on some of these milestones. When they look back, hopefully they're going to have fond memories of, of their high school experience. And again, it's going to be much different than what you or I experienced. But we, we did have uh, senior night uh, for all of our events, uh, cross country, again, swim, field hockey, volleyball, boys and girls soccer, uh, cheer, dance, and football normally would, would be together. They, they would be uh, kind of tripled up. So what we decided to do with football, with cheer, and with dance is, is holds a, a Friday night, October 7th, uh, their own special night. So we cleared Cotone Field, we did it at seven o'clock at night, we brought in the voice of the Eagles and we honored every, every senior on that. And if you're on our Facebook page, you probably saw those uh, 30 or 40 photos um, with the kids, with the parents, with the flowers. Uh, it really was a special evening. So, and again, we wanted to, uh, to do that. We also wanted to make sure that our marching band wasn't excluded. Our marching band, just like our athletes, practiced every single, uh, every single week. And they were able in the first week of November to put on um, three different performances. We had them invited them to halftime of our field hockey and soccer games where they performed. And then on, on, on a Wednesday, I think it was November 5th, they were able to have their own showcase. We invited the parents and we also live streamed that event as well. So the marching band uh, also had an opportunity uh, to showcase their talents and we wanted to, again, reward them for putting in all that time and effort. Um, some good news came out of 2020, uh, in, in addition to just having kids out there on the field and representing Weathersfield, um, our football team was given the Connecticut Athletic um, Association um, Sportsmanship Award in 2020. And it was for our work over the last five years with Team Maven. And if any of you remember uh, 
just just a, a wonderful person. Uh, Maven was a student over at Charles Wright, but she actually loved Weathersfield football, and uh, we've been pretty close with, with her family ever since. So uh, we had a nice little uh, write-up about Maven. It was submitted to the uh, state of Connecticut, and our football team was selected as the 2020 uh, sportsmanship winners. And in your packet from Mrs. Murphy, be able to read my submission um, to that. And again, it started in 2017 as she att attempted and unfortunately lost her battle with uh, DIPG. Um, coach Rob Yakum, one of our soccer coaches, our varsity boys soccer coach, uh, was able to uh, secure his 250th victory uh, at, at the uh, head of our soccer program. And he actually uh, did that in October by beating his alma mater over at Maloney. So we had another uh, great event uh, th that evening. We continued with our Pinktober campaign uh, where we raise awareness and, and raise some money for um, breast cancer. And we raised this year $450 that we're able to donate to Hartford Hospital and their digital mammography uh, um, program. Uh, field hockey in particular was able to, to raise $112 on, on their own. And a lot of the other monies uh, came from our t-shirt sales uh, this year. So that, that's just a quick overview of, 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 our, of our fall season. And again, I try to post as much information on social media uh, that, that's more timely. Um, and, and, and that's the fall. As I had briefly uh, indicated a little bit earlier uh, uh, tonight, uh, the WHS winter sports is, is really in limbo. Uh, Mr. Emmett receives communication as often as I do from the uh, CIAC, and all they've really told us at this point in time is that things are on pause until January 19th. They hope to have some information for us on January 4th, uh, but we don't know what that will look like. We don't know if the season will be uh, shortened, if we don't know if uh, sports will be uh, pushed off to an alternate season or even the, the spring season. We don't know what any of the mitigating strategies the CIAC or the um, state of Connecticut Health District would like to see us implement. Right now, there's talk of wearing masks uh, for all contests. That would include indoor, uh, indoor basketball in, in, in the rink, indoor hockey, uh, gymnastics, indoor track, and you know, and, and everything. So, unfortunately, I have really no information on on winter, winter sports at this uh, at this time. Um, one thing just to know that uh, of all of our sports, wrestling. Competitive cheer, competitive dance, and football are still classified as high-risk sports. And again, if, if you've read some of the language that's come out from uh, Governor Lamont's office, uh, those certainly cannot take place at all through the rest of this calendar year. And we're, again, waiting on guidance of what that's going to look like in, in the next calendar year in 20, 2021. Uh, they have outlined a potential, and I use the word potential on purpose, second semester alternative season. We haven't been given any dates but that is where 11 v 11 tackle football could take place. Again, a lot more questions than, than really answers regarding the CIC's um, alternative season. Um, spring sports again, we're, we're hoping since those athletes lost everything <clears throat> last year, we're hoping, and I think the CIC is hoping to allow for an entire full spring sports season. But again, no information has come out uh, to me, to Principal Moore or to Superintendent Emmett. Um, and again, just to end, end the note, certainly want to end it on, on a positive and on a high. Last week, or I think a week and a half ago, we had three different athletes uh, sign with colleges. Uh, Mia DeStephanie with Southern Connecticut uh, to swim, Sierra Judson in girls soccer uh, at Merrimack, and Olivia Thompson also in girls swim over to Fairfield. And I'm getting a few other uh, uh, messages and, and, and emails regarding some other athletes. And as they uh, choose to continue their play, at the next level, I'll certainly be uh, recognizing them and, and posting stuff on, on social media. So uh, just get a special thanks. I've, I've probably been on the phone with uh, Mr. Emmett uh, more than he probably probably wishes. Uh, as things change, as times they would change midday or even mid meeting. And just uh, like, like to thank him along with my fellow building administration, uh, Andrew Zazola in the athletic office, uh, our, our trainer, Sue Coco and Joanne Campbell, two of our technology teachers, um, have been instrumental in all the photos and all the live streaming of our games. I had a great uh, uh, set of game workers. And, and the reason you may ask why I, I had game workers, if, if the crowd was, was limited, we had a, really a, a presence, a WHS employee at all of our games at all of our levels this year, just to make sure people in the, in the crowd, 
people that were coming from other towns that might have uh, uh, you know been around the field were adhering to all of our our protocols and procedures, namely wearing a mask and, and socially distancing. And then we do have a student, a junior. If you've been to any game of late, um, he is the, the voice of the Eagles. Uh, he volunteered at uh, you know, probably over 100 different uh, contests uh, th this year uh, with, with some play-by-play -play and with uh, uh, doing the starting lineup. So I'd just like to thank Jimmy as, as well. So I'm not sure, Mr. Emmett, if, if the board or you, anybody has any questions regarding uh, high school athletics at, at this time? Thank you, Mr. Maltesi. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Maltesi? Yes, Ms. Evans. Hey, Mike. Um, I just wanted to thank you for your presentation and your efforts to try to keep sports alive for these kids. They were so huge for me in high school. And I know so many of the kids really appreciate how quick you guys pivoted with all of the changing information um, coming out every week. Um, and you gave them as much as you possibly could. The kids are being extremely resilient and understanding, trying to keep things safe. And the fact that there's been, there was no, um, no one got sick in our sports. You guys did everything right. And I really appreciate all the efforts because I'm sure it wasn't an easy task at all. So all right, well, no, th thank you. Like I said, I have a great, great team around me and, and our kids are wonderful. Our kids are great. They just wanted a chance to get out there on the field. So uh, they, they, they really did what we asked them to do. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Maltesi, how were the numbers compared to normal fall years? I know you shared with us like 380 student athletes. Is that low, much lower average? It, it, it's not much lower. I, I can get you the exact numbers, uh, Mr. Carey, if you'd like, but really, uh, and, and unfortunately we had, we had to make some cuts early on in the year just because of the cohorting and, and the numbers. Uh, we were very fortunate, you know, again, unlike most schools, even in our uh, own conference, and, and we're not one of the largest schools in Rutgers, we were able to uh, put, put out there a freshman team and I, and I think five or six different different sports. So uh, girl soccer, boy soccer, volleyball, field hockey, and it would have been freshman football. Uh, we, we would have had numbers for, for, freshman, for freshman teams. So I, I would say it's right on par with any other year in the fall. Great. No, I don't need – exact numbers. I was just wondering. Thank you. That's great to hear, though, that we had that many people participating. Yeah, I think as the summer wound down, kids just wanted to get uh, uh, just get out there and, and, and be involved in something somewhat normal. So I think that when the chance came out, they, uh, they gravitated towards it. Excellent. Thank you. Anyone else? No, just thank you, Michael. That was a Herculean task that you took. Very nice. Just thank you. Kids could play. Great job. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Great job. Keep up the great work with the social media. I'll keep trying. Thank you, Mike. All right. Uh, moving on. Announcements and information. Board members, please check your packet. Check to see if there's any upcoming meetings. If you can't make it, let the chair of the committee know. Board of Ed meetings held. Students Program Services, 11 17 20. Mr. Healy. Of course, I, it's not as prepared as I should be. I could let Sally carry the ball in this one, which I will, other than what we approved right now. And I'm trying to remember the other issues. We were talking about uh, some of the online uh, efforts as well. Wasn't that right, Sally? Yes, we had an up, uh, several updates. We had an update uh, from one of our um, partners called RSVP Reads. RSVP Reads is a federally funded grant program uh, that connects our senior citizens and seniors actually with, um, because of remote, not only seniors in Wethersfield, but other seniors around the state um, to support our um, elementary and middle school students um, in development and uh, reading. So uh, Teresa St Strong, the program manager, provided a update on all the changes we've made this year to provide these supports virtual. So the exciting part is, is that we didn't uh, cancel them, uh, but they were, you no know, looks very different uh, this year in the virtual environment. Uh, we also provided an update on um, the family learning uh, program uh, that was uh, previously held at the Ch uh, Trinity Church, um, which is uh, facilitated by Kim Bobbin, our family and early childhood coordinator and Svetlana Smith. 
from uh, Vrabi, and uh, they provided an overview of how their program that provides ESL um, language services for adults and preschool activities for their children um, and how they've made that program virtual um, through the help of a lot of partners and community partners. Um, and so they really highlighted many of the partners that they've been working with. Um, we also had uh, an update from Liz Freitas, John Kazar, and Sarah Harris around the SITES partnership, um, which is the Center on Inclusive Technology and Educational Systems. Um, they provided an overview of this uh, grant opportunity. We are one of um, a handful of districts across the nation um, involved in this partnership between special services and the instructional technology team to collaborate around a shared vision on providing inclusive practices um, and universal access for our students um, with speci um, specialized learning needs. And then we also provided a short overview on the update of remote learning. Um, at that time, we had both Silas Steven and Emerson Williams in remote learning and talked a little bit about the transition that was very seamless from our hybrid model to a remote learning model um, and highlighted some of the planning and structures that allowed that transition to be seamless for students, staff, and families. Um, and we've also taken that information from um, those schools to apply to our remote learning model that will be um, in place a week after Thanksgiving. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, Sally. You're welcome. Um, CREC Council meeting, 11, 18, 20. Ms. Granado. Uh, the CREC Council met on November 18th, another virtual meeting. Um, to always remind you, the CREC Council is the Capital Regional Educational Council, which Weatherfield's a member, along with 35 other surrounding towns. This council is responsible for the regional magnet schools, Project Choice, and this year CREC has also started the school year with organizing and working the Head Start program in Hartford. Um, there was discussion about the ease of the Zoom meetings, especially for CREC, for some of the towns that are on the outer edges of the CREC territory. And it would make council meetings easier to attend instead of traveling into Hartford. Um, this will require constitutional change. And also we discussed the constitutional change just to have it that the CREC council with no board of directors, because these two groups appear to be very redundant. We also had a presentation on the progress of the two new schools being built under the CREC guidance. They're stunning. The Academy of Aerospace and Engineering Elementary School in Rocky Hill. And this one is in the um, process of being built, the Anna Grace Academy of Arts, also an elementary school in Avon. Um, Patrice McCarthy is the legal liaison for CREC and CABE. And she spoke of the possibility of the General Assembly conducting a virtual meeting when the new session begins on January 6th. And Cabe and CREC are working on the educational priorities that they will be presenting to the assembly. And finally, Greg Florio, the executive director of CREC spoke on the disruption of school caused by the COVID pandemic. CREC schools will go virtual the week after Thanksgiving in anticipation of students and staff being exposed to the virus during the holiday. Classes will be online from November 30th to December 4th for all grades and then we'll resume in person on December 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Granado. F Finance and Operations Committee meeting held tonight, 11 20 I believe Mr. Michaels had bad internet connection. So we discussed this year's budget, which is currently under budget by just over five hundred thousand dollars. Over budget, under under budget. So we're doing well there. We're projecting well, and we discussed the timeline for next year's budget, and it's going to be pushed back from what we did last year to probably somewhere in January as a start. Anyone on the committee want to add anything? Excellent. Meeting scheduled facilities and maintenance committee twelve seven twenty at six p.m. Unfinished business, there is none. Public comment, Mr. Emmett, anyone on the phone wishing to make public comment? Yes, I have uh, one member of the public, 860-985-2717, if you could unmute. Good evening, if you could state your name and address for the record. Hi, it's Marjorie Carson. 
and I live at 12 Avalon Place. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, great. Um, first, I want to thank you all for doing such a great job during these crazy times of COVID. And from the superintendent to principals to staff, they're just working super hard to make um, this work and keep our kids safe. So I just am very, very um, thankful for you guys. Um, but for now, I just want to communicate my concern that I've had for a while now, but kind of COVID kind of stopped me from communicating this to the board that much. But I wanted to reiterate with you as you begin to make decisions for next school year, I figured I'd bring this topic up. Um, so I'm very concerned with the fact that the freshman class of Weathersfield High School no longer has a full year of social studies. Every district in the area requires and offers their freshman class a full year of social studies. Weathersfield High School used to up until last year when the required course, World History, was suddenly removed. Now the freshman class only gets a half year and thus half credit of social studies. So just want to give you a little backstory from when my daughter experiences last year. Um, so when she was in eighth grade, she, like most eight, eighth graders at the end of eighth grade, they're given a Weatherfield High School catalog to choose their classes. And she had to submit her request at the end of eighth grade and included required classes like language arts, math, science, and it included a full year of social studies. So then Fast forward to August, she was emailed her schedule from the high school, and for some reason, it was kind of hard to figure out that she had an extra study hall. We didn't know why. She didn't know that she, she saw she had in her art class she wanted, and she had all these other classes she remembered needing, but she didn't think much of it and couldn't figure it out. So neither myself nor my daughter, and I followed these things, had, um, we hadn't seen a high school schedule before from the high school, so they're a little bit hard to figure out at first glance. Um, it was not until I got an email days later from a parent that I know who was upset about the social studies class, and she, and she told us all that um, one of the classes had been cut. Most of us parents at that time had, didn't, didn't even realize it, and they hadn't noticed that a semester of social studies was cut, the one that was required at the end of eighth grade two months earlier. It was not until my daughter, I went back to the original high school catalog she got in eighth grade, the end of eighth grade, that we realized it was social studies that was missing, and that's why she had this extra study hall in addition to her other study halls. To be clear, she was days from starting ninth grade and no one from the high school, not the principal, not the counseling center, not no one from the administration notified any freshman parents that this required class had been eliminated. Um, maybe it was an oversight, I don't know why. But then we had to figure out who my daughter's counselor was and email her. Her counselor stated that the class had been eliminated and that my daughter had to make an appointment to come into the high school to meet with her and see if they could find a class available to fill that empty spot. So now here's the context. This is last year, an entire grade of almost 300 students who had just left eighth grade being told they were getting a full year of social studies now had to figure out a way to fill that semester with an alternative class. And they all had to come in to talk to their counselor to do so, almost 300 students. So, you know, fast forward now, let me just tell you the facts of kind of how this all played out. And I think a lot of times when you're in administration, you don't always know, or the Board of Ed, you don't really know how it affects or the communication, how it comes out and how people don't necessarily know what to do, especially if you're a freshman. So one of the, there's a few scenarios that happen. Many students and parents didn't realize the class was cut because they didn't realize from the schedule and they never bothered to try and fill it. And remember, there's no information sent by the school telling parents this information. It was only if you called or emailed that they told you what to do. This resulted in many students having more study halls than they needed and less credit earned for that freshman year. Another scenario was even if a student did make an appointment with a counselor and go in, many students could not get a class to fill that slot because many classes were already full. Remember, no new classes were created to fill the void of almost 300 students uh, needed for a class. So they could only get what was left over, such as a couple seats in one class or a few seats in another. In retrospect, this appears an impossible task, leaving many kids left with just another study hall, as many um, academic electives are not offered to freshmen or underclassmen. And then many students, like my daughter, were told there was only one class that fit into her time slot. So for my daughter, it was intro to computer programming. Um, she didn't want to take this course, but I forced her because she, if she needed another, she didn't need another study hall and it was a half credit she needed to earn and she would have lost if she didn't take it.
But if I had not been persistent in paying attention and getting all this information, my daughter would have slipped through the cracks and taken another study hall. She was 14 and more study halls sound like a good idea, right? But in fact, they're a waste of time half the time if you already have another one and it means less credit earned. And again, think about the context. This is the freshman class of last year, the first class that needed more credits to graduate than prior classes. This higher credit requirement was much discussed at Board of Ed meetings and presentations and to parents when their kids were nearing the end of eighth grade. So it boggles my, brain, my mind or my brain why the first thing to happen in their high school experience would be for this, high, this school district to eliminate an entire required course for the freshman year. Almost 300 students started out with less credit options than the grade before them, and they needed more credits to graduate. So here we are today. We have another freshman class that just started this year, and they, are, they have similar problems. They, too, get less credit right now, options for their freshman year, because there are less spots to fill that fill the half credit that they would have gotten if the class was still there. Um, so when this happened, I started to ask questions like, huh, what's going on? Why did this happen? We didn't know. No one told us. And um, one point I had, I was at a WSPC meeting and I asked Sally, you know, Mr. Mehmet was there, Sally Stoli was there. And her explanation was that they had to cut the course because it ha they needed the teachers to cover additional civics classes for juniors and seniors who needed to graduate. And that was pretty much the explanation as far as I remember it. This, but it didn't really make sense to me completely because they knew this the year before. Why did they suddenly cut the class after, in, you know, at August? So then I was at a parent meeting with Mr. Moore and other parents had asked about this. And he said it was a budget issue, that it was cut because of the budget issue, but budget issue. But still to this day, the publications that come out of the high school about what colleges are looking for in, in for student credit and what they require and what they need, four years of social studies. Elite colleges are asking for four years of social studies. So, you know, this, does, this doesn't make sense. So then I ran into somebody at a, at a social function and, and I heard from a social studies teacher at the high school that basically was ha what happened was there was a retirement, social studies of retirement and in the department and that they were ready or willing or going to hire a new teacher and to address the civics classes issue and to fulfill the freshman class uh, requirements, but that through Sally Distoli or some communication, they were told that they were cutting the, the class and the position. And um, so I don't know why I'm hearing different things, but I assume overall it was a budget issue because the spring before the, the board of ed had, cut, ed had to cut over a million, almost a million dollars from its budget. Um, but my issue is I, I attended some of those budget workshops and at not one point was it discussed that they were going to cut academic classes. They were going to cut festival band. They were going to cut social, uh, style student middle school activities, after school activities, all these things. They were going to cut, they cut an administrative position that Mike Vertigram had. Um, all these things they were going to cut or thinking of cutting, they didn't really need to at the end because they got money from the state. But no point did they discuss cutting social studies or any academic classes at the same time. They voted, not this Board of Ed, but the prior one, um, to add lacrosse, which is an expense. I was kind of surprised they would do that. They decided to add lacrosse at the high school, which I knew would be hard to cut away. So when you're adding a new sport, that's fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars in expense. That's a lot to add when you're already so, you know, struggling with your budgets. So here we are. Now, with uh, my daughter's class, had less academic credits offered to them. And so what I want from you now, and I'd like to see, is as you're looking forward this year to next year, look at the effects of what happened to the, the current freshman class and last year's freshman class, and see if you can bring back the, the, um, the, the social studies world history class and bring it back. Um, and I'd like you to answer the following questions, and I'll wrap up. Did the Board of Ed specifically vote to eliminate the social studies position and this required class? If so, when was that vote? I don't remember that. I believe um, there's a curriculum committee of the Board of Ed. Was there a discussion or serious consideration in this committee as to the curriculum, curriculum effects of cutting the social studies class from an entire grade, entire grade that was required? And when deciding to cut world history, did this cut impact students' ability to understand the content of their sophomore cl class on um, international studies? Have you asked or can you ask social studies teachers now about this impact? Have they had to change their own sophomore curriculum this year 
to reflect all the information today's sophomores never got last year. Another a question, did the Board of Ed ever ask this high school whether cutting this class would harm students' ability to earn academic credits, especially since they needed more than prior classes? Did, the, did or can the Board of Ed inquire whether cutting this required class for now, which is now over 500 students that don't have this cr a credit, does it mean too many students have had to take an extra study hall instead of earned credit because there's just no classes available? I mean, it's super tight. Um, did the freshman class of 2018-19 and 20 have less credit earned on average than the prior freshman class? Did the addition of lock, lock, lacrosse force the district to make the budget decision to eliminate this required social studies class? And finally, I'd like to say that if in the future, if the budget the town council passes forces the Board of Ed to, ed to cut academic classes at the high school, please tell parents, please tell us. We can't advocate for you or an issue if we ourselves are unaware of the effects of these budget cuts. And on ultimately, the town council does not know the effects of the budget cuts. They need to know as well. And what's most frustrating is that the cut came out of nowhere and no parents were told. And now our children who are expected to get more credits than prior classes have less ability to do so. So I urge you to revisit this issue. I know you have a lot on your plate, <laughs> but if it's something we can add back because every other district in the city area, the county area has a full year of social studies for the freshmen, I think we can do it too. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Marjorie. Anyone else on the phone, Mr. Emmett? No, Mr. Carey, nobody else. All right, moving on to board comment. Any board members mission, wishing to make comment? Elaine. Um, Mike, I would like to have the answers sent to all of us on Marjorie's questions because I can't answer them from our budget meetings either. Um, number two, I'm looking at uh, today's news and several, well, many teachers from the CEA and the AFT are marching with signs because they don't feel safe. Have any of our teachers expressed that they don't feel safe in their buildings. That's just a, a town issue. That's certainly what they're marching for in those other counties. Maybe their buildings, like we've discussed, don't have the social distancing possibilities and stuff. But I just want to know if you're hearing anything through the grapevine if our teachers aren't feeling safe. Yes, I, I um, hear. I, I hear. Uh, uh, let me speak to that piece with regard okay. to, to answers to the questions. I think what we're going to need to do is go back through and take a look at this video and ascertain all of those questions. Yes, oh, absolutely. Yeah, I get it. And, yeah, and no, no, it, no rush, but I'm interested in the answers. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I, I certainly wanna to speak to the issue about uh, teachers feeling uh, fearful and anxious. And the answer there is yes. It, oh, it, okay. It's, it's a reality. And you know, mm -hmm. again, as we go through the process of contact tracing and we have to notify staff members that they need to be quarantined, it certainly raises a level of concern. With regard to the fact that we're in hybrid, we're in hybrid for a reason. We're looking to uh, make sure that we decrease person density. That's what the hybrid model does. So we're able to maintain that six foot social distance. We're able um, to obviously from a perspective of having ample PPE, we have it. Having ample supplies, frequent hand washing, all of those mitigation strategies are clearly in place. But the reality is this, this virus is unpredictable. And you know, I mentioned earlier in the conversation about uh, you know, where it's spreading from. And we found a lot of spread from social interactions, uh, mm -hmm. Halloween parties. We found a lot of interaction uh, uh, in youth sports. You know, let me give you an example, Elaine. We have a notification that we have a student that is tested positive. We received for contact tracing purposes a list of uh, teammates. And those, mm -hmm. those towns span 20 different towns across two different states. Oh. And every single one of those students on that team is considered close contact and then has to quarantine. So that's where we've seen it's been community spread. And you know, again, I don't dictate what teachers do on their own time on the weekend. In some cases, they are out socializing. They may not be utilizing their own mitigation strategies. And, and people get sick. And as Charles Brown said from the CCHD, the community spread right now is, is so widespread 
it's becoming increasingly difficult to truly figure out where you got it. Sure. So the mitigation strategies are going to continue to be extraordinarily important moving forward. But thank you for the questions, Elaine. Uh, well, I need one. I have one other, two other things I want to address, Chuck, okay? Yeah, go ahead. Floor is yours. Okay. Um, Mike, I was reading, I looked up FMLA for COVID on the internet. And it seems to, if I read it correctly, which I could probably have misunderstood, is that um, FMLA for people who have to stay home for COVID is determined by where you work. Does that sound like, do we offer FMLA COVID <laughs> to our teachers who say, well, I, I have to stay home 14 days now. How, how are we dealing with the teachers who have the COVID disease, not the cold or the flu or no, I but are on leave. Yeah, we, we have a, uh, um, a code for that, Elaine. And in some cases, what we've done is when we've had to quarantine cohorts, we have the teacher continue to work remotely with her students and okay. everybody's working remotely. I've had other cases where I've had uh, teachers take FMLA COVID leave with yeah. regard to uh, caring for a, an ill relative or dealing with the childcare issue. So, and that's another one of those- um, Individual to, cases. Yeah, yeah, we have to take okay. that- Okay, I just wondered case. if we even no. use it, you know, and, and, and did no. I, do we pay this to, teacher who has to be, let's say home with a child who's got COVID? Do they get their pay, Mike, or do they yeah. get it taken away from their sick time? There, there is a formula that the uh, the law spells out okay. a certain percentage. Well, that's enough. Okay, mm -hmm. I just because I was reading it and I said you've got to clarify for me. Yep. And Mike, I would appreciate it if you could include in Friday updates notes from the social justice meeting you go to. Yeah, Elaine. What we do is we post those meetings, we record those, and yeah, uh, you do. previous information sessions. Um, so they're available in the event that you can't be there. We post those um, to the website, so you can go. Okay, back I'll and find them there. Okay, thank yep. you. That's thank you, Elaine. Chuck. Anyone else? Miss Evans. I'll be quick. Um, so I wanted to, this kind of piggybacks a little bit off of Elaine and talking about the teachers. Um, I kind of commend the district's decision to take the week after Thanksgiving off. I just came out of quarantine um, because I've done nothing in seven, eight months, but we got, we came in contact with someone and it's really stressful. Um, with an infant and a pre-existing condition in my house, just having four, 14 days at home with, you know, regular allergies and stuff, it was really stressful. And it just kind of, when I'm talking to some of the kids' teachers with full families at home themselves, I kind of see the anxiety there too. So quarantine after quarantine, I can see that adding up and having that. Um, I really commend the decision. I know it wasn't an easy one and all districts are doing different, but I've heard a lot of positive feedback from that as well, um, from some of other parents at my kids' school and stuff. So I, you know, appreciate what our district is doing. It is hard. I went back to work. I have an infant. I have kids home. It's really hard, but I feel like I feel safe with our classrooms. I feel like we're trying to keep our teachers safe. So I really appreciate, and I've gotten a lot of really good feedback on, um, just to add the light of what our district is doing. And it is hard and you see the kids kind of struggling sometimes, but you also see them being super resilient and truly moving forward. And the teachers are doing an amazing job. So I appreciate even giving our teachers just a breath to stay home and, and kind of work remotely and let them just take a deep breath too and kind of reset to kind of go because it's everywhere. Every I, I probably know eight people, um, in my family and everything else that have come down with it. And it's scary how different it affects everybody. So, um, you know, seeing it so close to home, it makes me appreciate this a little bit more. And I just wanted to share that with you. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Anyone else? Mr. Tiago. Tiago. Uh, I just want to uh, extend my thanks again to uh, Mr. Maltesi. Um, as a senior, I really didn't have any expectations of what a fall season would look like. And then just having uh, this fall season, it was just amazing. And then uh, to piggyback off of what Ms. Evans said, um, majority of the high schoolers are happy that we, uh, we have this week full remote week 
off after Thanksgiving. A lot of them feel that's a fantastic idea, and I agree. Uh, a lot of families are getting together. I think it's a good idea to uh, have a remote uh, remote week. Thank you. Ms. Granado. Um, not to end on a downer here, but I did go to the hunger action team meeting, right? It was virtual meeting. And uh, it, it really is um, it's a little frightening to hear what's going on. Top requests from residents in Wethersfield was rental payments and energy assistance. Um, this is that Alice group too, people being financially affected due to COVID and they are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, this is a long meeting here. Senior residents are on fixed income have been less affected, but people in their mid 60s who are working are very affected. Um, the Wethersfield High School, and Michael, this was Mike Moltesi, um, I guess the football team did tackle hunger food drive, um, which was very grateful and very generous of our Wethersfield students. Um, DECA is currently hosting a school-wide food drive to benefit the Wethersfield Food Bank, and Emerson Williams is also hosting a school-wide um, drive. The Dazzling Dozen is asking for support from local businesses and organizations to collect money and food each month for the Wethersfield Food Bank. Wethersfield Public Schools are offering free breakfast and lunch to all Wethersfield children age 18 and under. They're to pick the food up Monday through Friday, 1030 to 12 at Wethersfield High School. And um, I would like to take this time to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. I never thought of using the word grit when um, giving wishes on this holiday, but in this holiday, we must all show grace and grit. Um, this year has been most challenging. Everybody can't wait for 2020 to leave, um, but we are also thankful for many things and it truly is a time for courage and perseverance. So thank you and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Ms. Granada. Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanna pick up where Bobby left off and first urge the community and the folks listening out there to please practice uh, all the safety measures during Thanksgiving. We wanna try and avoid a spread in the community as much as possible. possible. So please be uh, diligent. Uh, wanna wish everybody a happy and safe Thanksgiving. And also say that to all the pictures on my Hollywood Square screen uh, tonight, it is, Great to work with you. I'm grateful to be a part of this group, all of you administrators and board members who work so hard. It's a pleasure for me. I'm grateful to be able to work with you uh, on this endeavor and wish you all a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lesser. Anyone else? Just one more thing, Chuck. Is that okay? okay. Yeah, of course. Um, Michael, I have to say, when I saw your um, remote learning for November 30th till December 4th, I think I was grateful and I support it because I had the experience of coming back from Texas at a 1 a.m. flight. Nothing is open at the airport to get your test. So I had to stay home, as Kelly was saying, till I could find a date to get tested, which was not until three days after I was home that I could have scheduled a test. So I think you've done the right thing uh, uh, for our teachers and for people traveling. Just wanted to show my support, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, anyone else? All right, thank you everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone stay safe. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. A second? Second. Thank you, all in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. opposed? Abstention, motion passes. Thank you everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Be safe, everyone. Enjoy.